Aloha, I'm Malia Zimmerman and this is News Behind the News. Today I have a guest, John Fun from the Wall Street Journal and many other media um, that he's appeared on. And he's going to talk to us today about the elections and also a little bit about Hawaii because he's certainly a familiar uh, face here in Hawaii. John, thank, thank you. you. Thanks sure. for coming on the show. Um, John, maybe you can give us a little bit of background on yourself and uh, I know you've been with the Wall Street Journal. Many well, people know I'm you, a, but I'm tell a, me. I'm a columnist on, uh, with the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, Leave Wright and I are writing a book uh, on stealing elections, which we can get to a little bit later. I'm also a contributor on Fox News and various other media outlets. And I'm a keen observer of state and local government and activities. Um, one of my jobs is to go look around and see what's happening in all 50 states and report on it. And Hawaii has some of the most interesting stories, whether it's the Bishop Trust story, whether it's the story about your election systems a few years ago, whether it's the story about the Akaka Bill, which is a long-running saga in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii has a lot of interesting stories. Some of them have more relevance to the mainland than the others, but it's a fascinating political climate you have here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, um, how about a little bit about the book that you have already have out, Stealing Elections. Tell me about that and what inspired you to write that book? Well, what inspired me to write that book was when I was in college, I had a term paper that I had to do and I decided to do it on a recount election on a state legislative seat in my home state of California. So I went to observe the recount and what I observed during the recount was many interesting things including people committing voter fraud in front of me. And people always ask me, well, why didn't you report the fraud? And I said, well, it was the local election officials who were doing it. <laughs> Uh, back then you had, um, you had uh, paper ballots and the easiest way to change the vote during the recount was to put a little bit of pencil underneath your fingernail and you would, you know, while you were counting them you would somehow make a mark mm. and as long as there was some kind of a mark next to a name you had to count it. So you could add votes, so you weren't subtracting votes, you were adding votes by making a little pencil mark next to the name. It, these are on ballots where, no, where some voters had not voted for that office, right. so there was all blank. Wow, amazing. So then you ended up writing the book and it covers several Well, Hawaii states. inspired me to some extent yes. because Hawaii in 1998 had a very contentious gubernatorial election. It was the first race between Linda Lingle and then it was Governor Ben Cayetano at the time and all kinds of hanky-panky was happening. You had, there were evidence, which I think you uncovered when mm -hmm. you were with uh, Pacific Business News, mm -hmm. about voters in various areas that were probably illegal aliens or undocumented and other people rising from the dead to vote. So Hawaii became one of the early chapters in my book. Definitely, I know we, can, we have our share of uh, problems, no doubt. But I understand things are a little better here. I believe so. There's been so. some oversight and watchdog activities. I think the elections division here is run much more professionally than And we replaced be. our chief elections officer. And well, I think that may that have something to do with it. Help a lot. Yes. What other states did you find out? What, you know, what are some of the other big problems with election fraud that are going on? Now that we're coming up to another election, we should watch out for. Well, what Americans probably don't realize is that we have the sloppiest election systems of any industrialized democracy. It's not my opinion. That's the opinion of Walter Dean Burnham, who's America's premier political scientist. And what he says is, you know, it's good that we have a decentralized election system. The states and localities have always handled it that way, but it means there's some places like Chicago, uh, there's some places like certain border counties in Texas, there's some places like some Republican-controlled counties in the middle of Kentucky where there's a long ingrained history of voter fraud. It's become part of the political culture, and rooting that out is very difficult. In addition to that, we have often a sloppy system with rules that are loosey-goosey, subject to vagrant or conflicting interpretations. We have an election system that's often so messed up or incompetent uh, that you can't tell sometimes where the incompetence ends and the fraud begins. So, for example, I'll give you a couple of examples of incompetence. We had this election in Wisconsin last year and the county clerk lost 8,000 votes. They were counted, but she didn't report them. So that just flipped the election from one candidate to another. And that was a very contentious Supreme Court race in Wisconsin. And if that had changed, you might have seen the end of Governor Scott Walker's reforms in Wisconsin if the Supreme Court had switched right. control from that. one side to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, just this a week and a half ago in Iowa, the caucuses. What happened to the caucuses? Mitt Romney won by eight votes. It turns out, though, that there are eyewitnesses, including the county chair, who say in one precinct a mistake was made. Instead of two votes for Mitt Romney, they recorded 22 votes. Oh, my goodness. Well, that add, if you add 20 votes to Mitt Romney's margin, he wins by eight votes. But if you subtract them, 
Rick Santorum won by 12 votes. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, there's no provision for a recount in Iowa because the caucuses are run by the parties. So right. there's no provision for a government recount. But just imagine how much different the media coverage would have been if that incompetence, if it was incompetence, uh, had been uncovered early that night, mm -hmm. and we would have had a completely different winner. Wow, amazing. So let's, now we're talking about the elections. Tell me about, what, what do you think about all this with Mitt Romney and, and the, the candidates that uh, are still left? Who do you think well, is- Well, if is, people watch this, we're yeah. going to be between the, the New Hampshire primary, which just happened, mm -hmm. and the South Carolina primary. Mm -hmm. And after that comes Florida, which is a winner-take-all state. That'll probably solidify the nomination for um, Mitt Romney if he wins that. Uh, I think we're looking at a situation where it's very much like 2008. John McCain was not particularly beloved. He was considered more moderate than many in the Republican Party wanted. Uh, right now, 65% of Republicans who just voted in New Hampshire said they wish the field had been bigger, had had more candidates. But Mitt Romney is a trusted hand. He's been around. Uh, people pretty much know him. He's a known quantity and he's run a very skillful, tactically clever campaign. Mm -hmm. Not exciting, but reliable. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a Chevrolet rather than a Lamborghini. And right now, unless Mitt Romney messes up, um, his, the number two candidate in New Hampshire was Ron Paul. He did very well, but there's no one who thinks that Ron Paul can actually be the Republican nominee. Mm -hmm. But he did attract an enormous number of young people to the campaign. 46% of young people under the age of 30 voted for Ron Paul in New Hampshire. So that shows the Republican Party, which has always not been viewed as having a problem with youth. Well, the good news is they now have youth flooding into the party. The bad news is they're flooding in for Ron Paul, who's, not, who's a mixed bag as far as many Republicans are concerned. Then you have um, John Huntsman, who did very well in New Hampshire because he spent all of his time there. But he's not going to do very well in South Carolina. In fact, the latest poll in South Carolina shows Stephen Colbert, the host of Comedy Central, mm -hmm. is, he's not actually put his name on the ballot in South Carolina because that's his home state. He has 5% of the vote. He's leading John Huntsman. Oh, dear. So if John Huntsman loses to Stephen Colbert, I don't think he's going to be the Republican nominee. Right. And then you have Rick Santorum, who did very well in Iowa, mm -hmm. but didn't do so well in New Hampshire. And Newt Gingrich, of course, you know, continues to fall. He got 11% or so in, New, in Iowa. He got 10% in New Hampshire. Uh, he's sinking. And I think what he's, he's angry at what Mitt Romney's friends did to beat him up in Iowa, so he's now lashing out with all kinds of ads attacking Mitt Romney's business background. So it's still a chaotic field, it's not settled, but you'd have to argue that unless Mitt Romney makes a big mistake in a debate or somewhere else, he's probably going to be the Republican nominee. So what do you think happened to Newt Gingrich? I mean, it, we, we've seen these rise and, and falls of so many candidates. What do you think it is that, that is it just the attacks on them, the focus on them? Well, you know, negative advertising is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are two kinds of negative advertising. There's the kind that's fair and the kind that's true. Unf the kind that's unfair and the kind that's true. Uh, most of the ads about Newt were true. I mean, he did take $1.6 million from Fannie Mae, which was the federal housing agency that was at the heart of the housing bubble collapse. He did take um, money from the ethanol lobby and then promoted ethanol, which of course is very popular in Iowa. But ethanol has also been viewed as now environmentally suspect. It's been viewed as a boondoggle that wastes taxpayers' dollars. And in fact, the ethanol tax subsidies have finally ended. Congress allowed them to lapse, which is amazing, an actual federal program that went out of business. Who would have thunk it? Mm -hmm. So I believe Newt suffered because he pictured himself as an outsider, but in reality, he's been a Washington insider. Even though he's been out of office for many years, he stayed in Washington, he became part of that culture. And I think if any people figured that out, they said, we like Newt, he's a smart guy, but I'm not sure I want him to be president. What about Rick Santorum? We saw him uh, do pretty well, and then... Well, New Hampshire is a different political place. Mm -hmm. um, it has fewer evangelical voters, and that was part of Rick Santorum's appeal. And the problem with Rick Santorum is he's a very bright guy, but sort of like Newt, he doesn't let a thought go unexpressed. I mean, he got into a ridiculous debate in New Hampshire about, and you know, part of this is the media just baiting candidates because they want to embarrass them or have them trip up. He got into a ridiculous debate about contraception and gay marriage in New Hampshire. Those aren't real national issues. They're very important state issues, but they're not real national issues. Mm -hmm. And I think he got, he got distracted because what people were looking for as an alternative to Mitt Romney was a full spectrum conservative, someone who had strong economic views and a strong economic track record and also some social conservative views. And Rick Santorum, I think, lost his lost focus on that in New Hampshire, and he, that's why he ended up with 10% of the vote. 
So do you think that there's going to be anybody coming into the race late, or is this it? It's Pretty over. much it's over. Look, the primary deadlines are passing. You require some organization to get on a primary ballot. Mm -hmm. um, what you see is what you get. Now, a lot of Republicans wish someone else were running. I know Republicans who say, if only Jeb Bush were running, if right. only Chris Christie were running, if only Mitch Daniels were running, if only Haley Barber were running. Well, they didn't decide to run, uh, either for family or other reasons. And I think that speaks to American politics right now. I think the media scrutiny and the hazing that you get, it's a real hazing, is so intense. A lot of people and their families don't want to go through it. I mean, we had, give you an example. There was a book that was published last year. It was called um, The Race. Um, and it was by Mark Halperin and John Heileman, two distinguished reporters. And they went behind the scenes of the 2008 race. What was it really like to be behind the curtain in the John Edwards campaign? Well, that was very interesting because they had a lot of stuff to hide and nobody knew what the candidate was really doing because he would lie to everybody. What was behind the Barack Obama administration? It wasn't always no drama Obama. It was a lot of infighting. Uh, what was behind the Hillary Clinton campaign? What was behind the John McCain campaign? A very chaotic campaign, it turns out. And one of the things that happened between 2008 and 2012 is the spouses of almost every candidate read that book. And it mm -hmm. described the toll that it takes on the family. Right. Exactly how many nights the candidate is away from home, sleeping in a strange bed, strange city. Um, exactly how vicious the media attacks can be. How much the staff infighting can take a toll on people's psyche. And John Thune, who's one of the Republican leaders in the Senate, was thinking of running for president. And they asked him, you know, why didn't you run? And he said, well, that book, my wife read it. Mm, and yeah. she said no. Right, right, right. So I think we ask a lot of presidential candidates. I think we ask even more of them than we used to. And I think increasingly people are saying, you know, it's just not something for me or I can't put my family through that. I think we have to re-examine our politics because if we want the best and brightest to run for office, if we want them to run for president, um, maybe we're scaring away some of the very good ones and ending up with people who are flashes in the pan. Read Barack Obama, uh, hope and change, hope and change, how's that working out for us? Mm -hmm. uh, very exciting candidate, but clearly had no administrative ability and sometimes that shows. You know, we just lost Bill Daley as his chief of staff. He now has had four chiefs of staff in the last three years. So I think if we really are losing something by the way we conduct our presidential elections. They last too long, they're too expensive, and they sometimes chase away the best candidates. Well, what about the Barack Obama? Let's talk about him, because of course we're in his uh, home, his uh, childhood state. And uh, what, you know, we hear a lot of, here from the mainland about the birth certificate issue and, and things like that. Um, and there's also, you know, questions about his background and has he really released information on himself. What do you think about that whole controversy? Well, the whole birth certificate thing is a complete ludicrous exercise. Um, I don't take people seriously who really raise that. Now, there is an issue which is separate from that, which is there's an awful lot we should have known about Barack Obama in 2008, and the media weren't very interested in finding that out. And the birth certificate is symbolic of that, even though it itself is a ridiculous issue. The fact of the matter is, and this comes from Mark Halpern, who was the political director of ABC News, he said in late 2008, just before the presidential election, no one had a bigger pass from the media in 2008 than Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted to make history. Everybody wanted the first African-American to be elected president. And he said it was fascinating. The mainstream media, what, you know, what everybody watches traditionally, ABC, CBS, NBC, New York Times, various other outlets, they spent more time investigating the minutes of the Wasilla, Alaska City Council meetings that Sarah Palin sat in when she was a city council member and mayor, as it, and then became vice presidential candidate, than they did all of Barack Obama's career in Chicago, which is one of the most notorious political machines in America. He said the in, lack of interest in Barack Obama's past was astonishing, whereas the obsession with Sarah Palin and in a sense finding out everything negative about her and believe me she helped I mean she was not the strongest candidate mm -hmm. was just jarring how how unfair the, the proportions were Barack Obama has a radical past in some ways I mean he worked for very radical community organizing organizations he was the top trainer for ACORN which has since collapsed because of its scandals he was their lawyer uh, he, he glided over all of those associations running for president uh, 
We also don't know very much about the legal clients he had. There are a whole lot of things that we don't know about Barack Obama when we elected him. Mm -hmm. And now we know where some of those weaknesses have led us. He's much more liberal than he let on. He's much more disorganized. Uh, he's much less willing to compromise than he let on. Remember, he was going to bring us all together, unite us. I don't think he really did or tried that hard. And I think the media really fell down on the job because they were more interested in history than in exactly who we were electing as president. Now, do you think that's going to change in this election? Do you think the media is going to do a little more investigation? Well, now Barack Obama has a record in office. Mm -hmm. So rather than go back to his past, we can look at the present. And the present is this. Barack Obama's aide said, you pass our stimulus bill, we guarantee unemployment won't go over 8%. Well, it's at 8.5% now. It's probably going to go higher rather than lower in the future because I think Europe is sliding into recession. If Europe catches pneumonia, we catch a cold at least. Um, Barack Obama said he was going to focus on job want, jobs as his laser beam focus. Uh, instead, he pursued health care, cap and trade, a whole bunch of things. Um, his signature measure, reform measure, uh, Obamacare, is at 35% approval. 35% approval in the latest polls, and that's the Gallup poll. Mm -hmm. Among Democrats, his approval rating among, for Obamacare is 52% among Democrats. Now, some of them think that he should have gone further and it's not left-wing enough, but a large number of Americans are troubled mm -hmm. because they think they're going to lose access to medical procedures, costs are not going to be contained, and a lot of the uninsured that are going to get new health insurance, it turns out that 45% of them are going to be dumped into Medicaid which is the substandard medicine given to the poor in this country. And, you know, look, Medicaid is not what people expected when they thought they were going to get health insurance. It's increasingly going to be cost controls. They're going to be rationing on it. You know, I wouldn't take my dog to Medicaid. So do you think Hillary Clinton's going to be in this race? Or do you think she's going no. to stay in her position? Well, she's already announced she's leaving the Secretary of State's job. Mm -hmm. I think she's seen a lot of things happen in the Obama administration that have circumscribed her authority. Uh, I think she's tired. Uh, she's not going to be Obama's vice president. They're not going to switch jobs between her and Joe Biden. Um, you know, some people joke that uh, for one reason alone, Obama would never make Hillary Clinton his vice president because he'd always need a food taster. <laughs> There's still enmity between the Clintons and the Obamas. Certainly, Still right. enmity. Um, you know, Bill Clinton still hasn't really kissed and made up with Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be Obama-Biden and it's against the Republicans, and it looks like Mitt Romney is the most likely Republican. And the most likely Republican vice presidential candidate is Marco Rubio from Florida, mm -hmm. who's a very exciting senator and also would be an attempt to appeal to the Hispanic vote. So when you pit that against <coughs> each other, them against each other, uh, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, and, and uh, what do you, how do you see that playing out? I mean, right now, if it was the election was today. Well, look, I'm not an historical determinist, but if you look back at history, no president since modern polling was invented 80 years ago has ever won re-election if unemployment was over 7.2 percent. People do vote their pocketbooks. Unemployment is 8.5 percent. Underemployment, which includes all the people who aren't working the hours they want or they're working half time, um, is probably 16 or 17 percent. Those are really tough conditions for a president to win re-election in. Mm -hmm. the, the one who won, by the way, when unemployment was 7.2 percent was Ronald Reagan. And I think even Barack Obama's supporters will tell you, well, we remember Ronald Reagan. We didn't like everything he did, but he, Barack Obama's no Ronald Reagan. And you knew Ronald Reagan. I did. Yes. In fact, I was in high school in Sacramento, California, and one day in my civics class, a teacher called me up and said, well, you know, they've gotten a call from the governor's office. They do a weekly press conference with high school students and the governor. It's his attempt to reach out to young people. And... There's a vacancy. Somebody couldn't make it. And they've called around. And they, would you like to go and substitute for someone and ask questions of the governor of California, who was Ronald Reagan? And I did. And apparently, I did a good enough job. I became a seminar regular on the show. I think I appeared on television with Ronald Reagan ten times. Wow! And it helped change my life because the last show after the after we had a little party, you know, to end the show, he was leaving the office of governor. Um, the last show, he took me aside and he showed me how he constructed and made his speeches. And to this day, when I make a speech, I use the same tips, the same lessons, the same organizational flow chart that Ronald Reagan taught me on how to give a speech. Amazing. Lucky. So 
For me, mm -hmm. the Gipper was not just a great American, he was an inspira a personal inspiration. That's great. Okay, I want to talk about Hawaii too, about a caca bill. Uh, you followed this issue very closely. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for 10 or so years in Congress where it's been debated. And of course, that's introduced for Senator Daniel Akaka, and it's to create a uh, race-based, um, another government entity in Hawaii. And what do you think about that whole debate, and how have you seen that progress or not progress over the last decade? Well, I find it fascinating because everyone in Hawaii in a position of authority seems to be in favor of it publicly, but privately there are a lot of concerns. Uh, I think it will tend to divide Hawaiians. Uh, I think it will lead to an enormous amount of duplication and waste. Uh, we already have too many levels of government in Hawaii. We already have too many conflicting priorities and conflicting duties and responsibilities. And I think that there's a lot of pork barrel involved in it. I mean, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has not been a paragon of governmental efficiency. And I think, even though the, opponent, the supporters of the Ikaka Bill say it wouldn't, it would basically take all Native Hawaiians and turn them into another Indian tribe, right. subject to their own set of laws, their own set of uh, exemptions from the rest of the laws that govern the rest of us. Um, I spoke with a Native Hawaiian here just a couple days ago who told me if the Akaka Bill passed and we were treated like an Indian tribe, that would meant even if I moved to California, I'd still be subject to the jurisdiction of whatever the Office of Hawaiian Government Affairs, you know, who that was would be created to govern the tribe, uh, would want. Um, maybe they'd want to tax me. Well, in theory, they could, even if I'm living in another state. So they always tout the benefits for Native Hawaiians. But I think a lot of Native Hawaiians realize this is the white man's idea of how to treat Native Hawaiians. I don't think that's worked out necessarily all that well in the past. And I think there's right now a lot of harmony in Hawaii, even though there's some concern on the part of Native Hawaiians that they're injustices. Most people in Hawaii live well together. They live in peace. They live in, with mutual respect for their diverse cultures. I think the Akaka Bill is not going to bring people together. It's going to divide people. And one of the reasons it's not going to pass the United States Senate anytime soon is enough senators have figured this out. They've basically said publicly, we're going to block this. This is the kind of racial balkanization that we've seen in Europe. It didn't work there. It didn't really work with the Indian tribes. The tribal system has been a disaster for many reasons. And we're not going to go there. So I think Senator Akaka and Senator Inouye can still pursue it. They can still try to attach it to various bills. But it's not going anywhere. The Akaka bill has become the Akaka farce. It's become an excuse to avoid addressing the real life, everyday problems that Native Hawaiians have, which are bad education, poverty, um, you know, difficulties in the home, a whole range of things that really, there are a whole bunch of things that need to be done to address that. Putting a piece of paper through the Congress, calling it the Akaka bill, and saying this is gonna really help Native Hawaiians, it's a, it's a palliative. It's, it's medicine that, doesn't re, that really won't help the patient. It'll probably hurt the patient. And also, it's just like everything else we've seen in Hawaii with the government. It helps a few people at the top. And they are oh, the ones always. that get yeah. the wealth and get the power. Well, and we, we have the seen this in the else. past, the bishop mm -hmm. estate. You know, anytime you get a few, a few people running an organization and there's lack of accountability. And remember, a separate sovereign government would have much less accountability than the local Hawaiian government would. Mm -hmm. You're going to get people in there who can abuse the system, who can become power mad, uh, who can transfer money, try to use it to wield political influence. And how, many, how much real everyday control or oversight would Native Hawaiians have over the people who were supposedly running this new governmental structure? I suspect very little. That's certainly the case in many Indian tribes in the mainland. So I understand that you went on a, or what's your prediction for that, that bill? Basically that it's not going to pass anytime soon in the if Senate. It has to pass the United States Senate. Yeah. It is dead on arrival. Mm -hmm. And even though Daniel Holinoe is respected among his colleagues, they basically said, Dan, you're asking too much. Right. Sorry, not going to happen. Right. Okay, now I understand you went on a rail tour today of where the route, where the city wants to put the rail route. The great, the great shadow creating hulking Rail structures. Steel yes. on steel rail system. Yeah. Elevated steel on steel. And well, we I'm from California where we have supposedly the fast bullet train rail system being built out of the middle of the arid Central Valley. Uh, I think this is almost as ludicrous as that project, which is already on its last legs. I think the Honolulu rail system is the local version of the California fast train, and it's a train, it's a train from nowhere to nowhere. And uh, I think in here, I mean, yes, one part of the train would be the Alamoana Center, 
The other part would be in the middle of the fields where they hope to have future development. But this will cost $5 billion. At least. At least. Right, probably right. a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I don't see commuters taking it. I really don't. Uh, I do see a lot of construction for the next eight years, which would tie up traffic even more. I see a, the government has finally admitted this would actually, traffic will be worse and more congested after the rail system is built than before. So what are you getting except a whole bunch of temporary jobs for politically well-connected unions and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, developers who are going to be very happy and a lot of construction companies that are going to be very happy. Um, I don't see the average Hawaiian benefiting from this. Uh, I think there are better ways to handle the traffic problem. I know there was a conference here that Cliff Slater helped organize and it involved transportation experts from all over the country talking about let's have hot lanes. These are toll lanes that are next to the free lanes People pay money and you can have two lanes that are hot, one each direction for people who want to go through. They work very well in California, I've seen them. And you can, you can use the other lanes as well. You can use the free lanes or the paid lanes right. depending on what you want to do. Depending on how much you want to pay right. and depending on what your premium on time is. Mm -hmm. And that could probably be done for a few hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Tampa Bay in Florida has had one. Riverside, California has had one for a long time. They work very well. And it could be done for a fraction of the cost. You wouldn't kill 900 trees. You wouldn't have the environmental problems. And you wouldn't have downtown with this giant hulking shadow casting monolith, mm -hmm. you know, which I think will be viewed as a, a monument to folly mm -hmm. if it's ever built. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to see because Cliff is, of course, one of the plaintiffs in a lawsuit that's trying to stop it. So along we'll with former happens. Governor Cayetano, mm -hmm. strange bedfellows, yes. along with State Senator Sam Slom, mm -hmm. along with a whole bunch of people you wouldn't expect to be in the same political bed, uh, but they all recognize, look, there's right and there's left, and there's sanity and insanity, mm -hmm. and this rail system is just insane. Okay, final thoughts. We have about 30 seconds. Any final thoughts on uh, the future of uh, Hawaii or the, or the elections coming up? Well, I... Th I think Barack Obama will clearly carry Hawaii. I mean, he is the native son. Mm -hmm. But I think that the future of Hawaii is going to have to be to find a way to keep small businesses here and grow and incubate small businesses that uh, have been strangled and suffocated beforehand. If Hawaii is going to have a future, it's going to have to grow its economy in an environmentally responsible way, and it's going to have to relook everything. Re environmental regulations, other regulations that have been preventing people from making Hawaii not just a climate paradise and not just a vacation paradise, but a paradise for the people who actually came to live here. And it still is a wonderful place, but it can be a lot better. All right. Well, John Fun, thank you so thank much. You. People can watch for you on Fox News, read you in the Wall Street That's Journal, right. and see your new books coming out very yes, soon. Yes, and I'll be back in Hawaii to help promote them. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. This has been News Behind the News. Aloha.